Welcome to the Shooting the Cue podcast, presented by Heat Riles Barbecue, with tips, tricks, and an inside look with some of the top pitmasters in the game. Now here's your host, Heath Riles. All right, everybody, welcome back to Shooting the Cue. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Mike Starr from Blazing Star Barbecue. Mike, how are you this morning? Can't complain, man. Living the good life. How about you, Heath? Well, you know, I ain't going to lie. I'm ready for Labor Day. Uh, you know, we got a long weekend coming up and all that. And so, uh, really looking forward to getting out there. I'm going dove hunting this weekend. Oh so. man, there you go. Nothing like some little dove on the, on the barbecue, huh? Uh, well, if we can <clears throat> get lucky and harvest some, I'm sure there's going to be some bacon and some marinade around and we're going to have to bake and wrap them and throw them on the grill yeah. for sure. Sound so delicate. for everybody that don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into barbecue, Mike. Okay. So my name is Mike Starr. Uh, I'm originally from North Carolina. I joined the military right out of high school, Air Force. Ended up spending 21 years in the Air Force, traveling all over the world, uh, experiencing unique cultures and uh, unique food. Uh, fast forward to 2020. You know, I was always in the military. I was the guy behind the grill. There was a squadron party, a party in how, base housing or something like that. I was the guy on the grill that people were bringing ribs to, steaks over, you know, for me to cook up. Just something I enjoyed doing. Just kind of like a passion of mine. You know, something about seeing people try your food and then the expression on their face afterwards. It's just something I enjoyed. I had experimented with making my own sauces and seasonings pretty much throughout my whole time in the military, mainly because uh, I didn't have options of like getting rubs and stuff like that in some places where I was at. And I would try these different foods, you know, on my travels. So the only way for me to have them was to experiment and play around with the different spices and stuff like that. Like I said, fast forward to 2020, right before COVID, we had helped uh, some of our friends open up multiple restaurants in Las Vegas, and they reached out to us again, like January, February time frame of 2020, asked uh, for my help again. I just assumed it was another Filipino or Vietnamese restaurant, because that's what they typically have opened up. Turns out I showed up, it was a barbecue restaurant. I is this what kind of barbecue is this? You know, and they're like, "Oh, you're what, what you like." I'm like, "Well, I like everything." But uh, <clears throat> anyways, they were like more traditional American style barbecue. So uh, I helped them with the normal stuff, security cameras and websites and stuff like that. But they also needed help on the barbecue side. Of things. And they were like, "Hey, don't you make your own sauce and seasonings?" I'm like, "Yeah, I do." They're like, can we try one of your sauces? I was like, "Sure." So I brought them in a sauce the next time I came in. I brought a little mason jar of some sauce. They tried it, and they are like, man, this is really good. We'd like to use it in our restaurant. Okay, how's that work? They were like, well, you make it, and we buy it from you. I was like, okay, I can handle that. So they opened up the restaurant. I was making about 20 gallons a week for them. Things were going good. And then, boom, COVID happened. Locked everything down. You know, put them in a bad situation because they were a new restaurant, so they didn't have no yeah. like clientele built up or anything like that. So they were kind of hurting on the money side of the house and weren't really able to continue to pay for, you know, the sauces and everything to be made. So they were cutting back everywhere. Well, meanwhile, I had already kind of created a an Instagram account to kind of promote them, uh, their business. And I created Blazing Star Barbecue, the logo and everything else. I'd already had that in my mind, the name Blazing Star Barbecue, for years. Uh, so I ran with it. And uh, next thing you know, people reached out to me on social media. How do we buy it? I was like, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, boom, created a website and then just started going. Sauces took off really well. People were, during COVID, it actually helped me because... Since we were in COVID, people were at home cooking, looking to experiment. So they were looking to try, you know, something different. And uh, the sauces did well. So then I decided, well, let's come out with a couple of seasonings. 
and the seasonings ended up doing better than the sauces. We just kind of built on it from there, and now we've been in business a little over three years now, and you know, just uh, you know, blessed to be in a situation of that I've never even imagined would ever happen. You've uh, you've got some interesting products for sure. Uh, so tell us a little bit about some of your products. I'm going to be honest; I've never tried them. I'm going to have to order some. Um, I'm terrible at at getting other well, people's got, products you got so, so much it, stuff that you've got to concentrate on yourself so i understand that you know well no I, a, I use other people's products at home um yeah. and, and test out stuff and compare stuff to what i have you know i like to know what other flavors are in the market you know and all that right. i love to i need to get i need to order some of your stuff and try it uh because i don't have a lot of hot stuff and so you've got a lot of like spicy mm. options is that correct mm, that's correct that's kind of been more of my niche so to speak, you know, uh, I think the blazing star, you know, it kind of gives it away. Everything I have has a little kick, you know, I think matter of fact, somebody messaged me the other day, do you have a milder version of your pork and rub? I'm like, well, that is my mild, <laughs> you know? Uh, so yeah, we have five seasonings. We have an all in one, which is more of a, like a, uh, all purpose season. It's a season all really. We have a beef rub. Everybody has an SPG in their in their lineup. Mine's just a uh, kind of SPG on crack. And then I have my pork and rub, which is really my OG seasoning. I used to call it scrub, and it's you know just a, a mix of some bold flavors with with a little kick, right? And then we came out with a Reaper rub and the Scorpion rub. Those are our two biggest sellers: our Reaper rub and Scorpion rub. Like I said, that, that's kind of our niche is, you know, a spicy seasoning that just is packed full of flavors. You know, I think a lot of stuff that's on the market says it's spicy, but really is probably mild, you know, or it's way spicy and it doesn't have a whole lot of flavor. Yeah. So I, I think we kind of landed in a sweet spot, you know, so to speak, that we have a pretty good balance of our sweet spicy and savory all together and then we have three sauces which i started the company with my original barbecue sauce once again it i had people tell me that uh don't you think this is a little spicy for like an original sauce and you know i've debated over that for a while but then i said you know what no it's my original sauce you know and that's why it's called that and then i have a spicy barbecue sauce and then an asian bank sauce so on your Asian sauce, does this have seeds in it? I do have some sesame seeds in it, yes. Damn it. <laughs> I can't have sesame seeds is the reason oh, I say that. Dang. I'm oh, sorry to hear yeah. that. Yeah. And we that's yeah. something that we went back and forth on too, you know, with the sesame seed. Of course we have Unstrain it out. No yeah, problem. Right? <laughs> oh, no, they say sesame seeds really don't have a taste. It's more of a texture thing. It is uh, a texture thing. After time, you know, it could, you know, take on a little bit of flavor, but it's it's a you know a long yeah. period of time before it has. It's, yeah. It is definitely more of a more of an earthy nutty yes. taste that it would bring exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's uh, your Reaper rub sounds really fantastic. And so does the Scorpion. I'm definitely going to try those, especially on dry rubs. I I don't have a really spicy spicy rub. My hot rub is really not spicy. Yeah. Um, I do have a, a rub that we're going to release coming up maybe near the first of the year. It's a, it's more of a spicy version of the garlic jalapeno, but, nice. um, we've had it for about a year now and I like playing for st with stuff about a year and finding out all its purposes and means. Oh yeah, for sure. It. So I've been saying I was going to release glazes for five years and they're just now coming <laughs> soon. Right. So. It's, it's one hard, of those man. types of deals. Yeah. So going back about your military service, what, if you don't mind me asking, what exactly did yeah. you do in your military service? And second off, thank you for your service. My pleasure. Uh, like I said, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for my time in the service. You know, I was, uh, I was kind of lost in the, you know, coming out of the, you know, the country, you know, back home in the South, you know, everybody worked in a factory, you know, my mom and dad worked in a furniture factory. I didn't know, have a clue what I wanted to do. I had some aspirations, but I don't, I didn't think college was the right avenue at that time frame. So I was fortunate enough to get one of my top five selections, which was uh, satellite and wideband communications. So uh, basically I 
my I came in as a basically a satellite and what they call a microwave radio communications operator slash maintenance technician. Allowed me to have some pretty cool jobs. After about five years in, you know, I did a lot of mobile stuff, deployed with the army and stuff. And it was it was cool, it was fun, but then I got a an opportunity to go to a flying gig in Nebraska where I got to work on what they call the National Airborne Operations Center or the Airborne Pentagon. Basically I followed the president around, took the SecDef, the Sec State, the Joint Chiefs of Staff all over the world. I did that for about five years, which then you get into a job like that with you know, top secret clearances and stuff like that, more doors open up for you in the military. And then uh, I got reached out to some people in the Las Vegas area, moved to Las Vegas. I worked there for five years, went to Korea for a year, uh, about 13 months actually, and then came back and finished up my, my career in Las Vegas area. And that's how I kind of just stayed out here in, in the Las Vegas area, moved to a small town outside of Vegas just because I you know I didn't like the city and you know I wanted to have some land and you know privacy wow sounds like you had an interesting career in the military uh that's definitely some talks we're going to have a cocktail over (laughs) I've had several people they always reach out to me especially when they they find out you know what I did and you know working in in Las Vegas area and uh yeah. Well, I've had a, a lot of friends in the in the that kind of industry. I'm gonna say like you, that's right. done special things. And I had one friend. He called his parents, and when 9 11 actually happened, and told him he didn't know when he'd ever see him again. That he was yeah. leaving the country, and that's all he could yeah. tell them. And like 11 months later, the phone ring, and he talked to his parents again. Yeah. And he he done. He was an operator. I mean, so you can imagine he. Uh, yeah. Kind of one of those types. I was actually. Uh, on a plane during 9-11 when that happened. And, uh, you know, actually hooked up comm lines to Air Force One, President Bush at Offutt Air Force. He went from Florida to Barksdale, Louisiana, from Barksdale, Louisiana to Omaha, Nebraska, Air Force Base, and hooked up with him. I was supposed to go to a job prior to that, that 9-11 happened, which I was going to be a special operator, Tom guy, basically for special forces. Needless to say, that didn't happen because of 9-11. They needed me at the current job frame, which probably ended up being a blessing because, you know, there's a good chance something would have happened to me if I hadn't have, you know, taken that other position, you know, during that time frame. But yeah, definitely some crazy times. Yeah, definitely some crazy times. And talking about crazy times, what about this Key West trip we just got back oh, man. from, man? I can't, I can't stop thinking about it. I, I, I want to book another trip to head down to Key West. That was absolutely, you know, what Bear and Burton WSL were able to pull off and put together was absolutely. And you know, the word epic gets thrown out there a lot, so I'm going to say legendary. It, it was definitely for the first year event that come together within a matter of months. I mean, yes. there wasn't very many hiccups and no, it went wasn't. off with an absolute bang. I think everybody could live with, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I can't even name a hiccup. That's how thinking about the trip, right. how good it was. I mean, I know there was a couple, you know, logistical hiccups with people, but I mean, it was nothing that didn't get fixed really fast. Well, and and if it was a hiccup, was it really something any of us cared about? Because we're like, heck, I don't okay. care. I'm here. Yeah. Look at this. They're this here, is over here. Right. There's, a boat, there's pools. There's boats. Well, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make it. I'm, I'm a survivor. <laughs> yeah. When, when's the yeah. next invite? Let's go. <laughs> well, you know, talking about that, I'm wanting to go back and go fishing before we do the tournament yeah, yeah. again. I want to get a little more uh, experience under my belt, I guess I should I say. Yeah. Some I of those you. waters. I've, I've deep sea fished for a lot of reds and snapper mm-hmm. and things like that, but uh, never like down in the Keys fishing for barracudas and tarpon and all yeah. that. That was yeah. something totally different, which is very no cool. No doubt. Um, you know, let's talk about your popularity on social media. How did you really get going on TikTok? And when did you know you really had something to catch on? 
So uh, originally, like I said, I started my account on Instagram more so than anything. That's where I got traction. But it was the end of 2020, let's say October, November time frame of 2020. There was uh, one video that came out, 402 Dog, I can't think of his name. The guy that was on the skateboard uh, with the ocean spray. Oh, yeah. yeah Playing yeah. Dreams, Fleetwood Mac. Yep, that's it. So that video went viral. I didn't know at the time frame when it went viral that it was from TikTok, but I figured it out. And at that time frame, uh, I saw a report that said in two months time frame, Ocean Spray sold more products than they sold in the previous two years. I was like, what? That's crazy. That's unbelievable. I'm like, I had avoided, especially with my military background, I had avoided TikTok like a plague, right? So I was kind of like, all right, I need to jump on here and figure out what's going on. As soon as I jumped on there, I saw Dano seasoning, and I started watching his videos. And I was like, well, who is this? I've never heard of this. So I searched them on Google, and at that time frame, it was the number one search seasoning on Google. I was like, okay, wow. If this guy can do this, I can do this, right? So I just started the TikTok account, started, you know, posting videos. At first, I was doing some stupid stuff. You know, I was doing anything just to try to figure it out. But then as I started watching other content creators on TikTok and started figuring out, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to start making some kind of like cooking video, something to get people's attention you know then i started uh n connecting with different food content creators that i thought maybe might benefit with my products so i reached out to them said hey i'm going to send you some products if you're cool with that you know and see what happens boom next thing you know a couple of them started posting videos with my products and uh messaging me on the side like man this is really good you know, I really like your stuff, posting products. Next thing you know, one of them's video went viral, and boom, I wake up the next morning, I have like 100 orders. I'm like, okay, this is cool, you know. So I just kept doing that, <clears throat> and more and more, it, you know, it started becoming bigger and bigger, and I was like, okay, this is, this is something here. I got something here. It's not just, you know, some seasoning that's just for my backyard. Or whatever people actually enjoy you know the products that i have and you know more and more people are, are starting to purchase it and po post about it you know it's it's i feel like you have a good brand for the short amount of time you've been going i mean you got a great name and with the the niche that you said you went into that market the more of the the spicy kicked up version uh, and yeah. i'm really big on flavors you know what i mean i'm bringing yeah. i'm bringing up to the table yeah. matter not really that spicy, but just punch of flavor, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think about it like the competition background is how I thought about it. A judge is going to take one bite, so I want to blow their palate out. Yeah. And so I tried to make a lot of my rubs, you know, that way. And I was using MSG at first and all that. And now I don't, when I develop something, I try not to use MSG in it. Right. Uh, sometimes it's a great flavor enhancer. I know a lot of people has mixed emotions about that. And, yeah, you know, it's kind of like who's got the bigger better chicken sandwich you know what i mean i'm gonna let somebody else fight about that if i decide to use it or use it if i don't i don't that that's kind of where i'm at too with everything and you know i get people that reach out to me all the time and say hey when are you going to come out with this seasoning this season i'm like i don't need to there's somebody else on the market that already has that you know i'm going to concentrate on what i'm doing and work with you know with what i'm doing and i kind of found out too that the more i work with other companies right and supported other companies like like companies where other people would consider them you know they're competitors no they're not competitors i mean at the end of the day i don't if, i'm the same way yeah and i don't think people are competitors i think there's enough room in the market for everybody yeah. i think everybody has uh wants to try stuff different and wants to taste different flavors and let's face it there's some great combinations out there rubs unbelievable and, combinations I mean, yep i mean so i I come from that comp background before I had all my rubs. I use other people's products. Uh, yep. I openly use other people's products in videos. I mean, I support other people because that's what it's about. I, I mean, agree. I'm not, uh, 
I don't know. It's it's kind of cool to be able to mix and use other people's stuff and turn out a great product. Well, and I think other people relate to that better too. You know, I, I think when it comes across as like, you know, oh, this is the only product you can use. No, there's, it's not the only product, you know. You know, there's no such thing as the best product, right? Because at the end of the day, everything is, you know, you know, each everybody has their own flavor profiles that they enjoy and like, right? What's good for you might not be good for me and so on and so on, you know? That's right. That's right. Everybody has a different uniqueness to, to everything, uh, for sure. Um, so you've got 350,000 followers on TikTok now. What's, what's been some of the biggest challenges as you've, you know, grown your account? What's been some of the biggest challenges you've seen on like producing content and making content? You know, uh, since I'm, you know, much like yourself, I'm a brand, but I'm a content creator at the same time frame, right? You know, you, you, you kind of fall into, I think most influencers, they kind of have a, a certain way that, that attracts themselves to their following, right? And they get used to it. Whereas me, I find myself, I can't really stick to that. I've got to change it up. You know, whether it be, you know, to try to push my products or to try to get information out to the public and stuff like that. So I find myself trying to figure it out. You know, I don't worry too much about the views because I realize that they just come and go. You know, you just never know when it's going to hit. You know, the one video is going to hit. Matter of fact, the my biggest video, I didn't even have my product in it. You know, I actually uh, had Me them. too. Same way. <laughs> I had them in a shaker. I was doing a steak competition, and uh, I had them in a, a little shaker, seasoning shaker that had no label on it or nothing. And I was like, seriously, my biggest video, I don't even have my, my actual product, you know, logo or something on. But uh, it's, you know, it, it it's tough. You know, you got to stay on it. You got to stay consistent with it. That's the thing is try to stay consistent, you know, stay engaged with your audience and stuff like that. And it's tough to do sometimes, you know, especially when, you know, traction comes and goes. Yeah. Well, it's definitely uh, a spinning your wheels kind of moment on social media. One minute you feel like you're getting traction next minute you're not. And, and to your point, you never know what video is going to go viral and you can upload one and it may not go viral for, six weeks, six months, who knows? Yep. Um, yep. You know, somebody picks up on it, makes one comment and then somebody runs with it. I mean, yep. that's typically how, how that's usually how it works. Right. Yeah. It's, I it's mean, usually you know, the hate or, or something that gets it going. You know what I mean? Which is it's, fine. It's, it's a, <laughs> it's, and I don't know how your account is, but I know on ours, we, I don't understand people sometimes, you know, like the, there's always more than one way to do things or more than one way to cook it. And people have their personal preferences on how yeah. to make something or do something. And, and I, I always try to say, this is just my version of it. And, you know, do whatever you want to do. Sometimes I may not say that, but some of these people yeah. I, like I committed suicide to people. I tell you, I, man, that there's a lot of gatekeepers on social media. There's a lot of people that instantly think they're Gordon Ramsay, you know, on social media. It's comical, you know, I just well, I'm sure Gordon Ramsay's a he's a great cook, but right. you take him out of his element of the kitchen. Oh yeah, yeah. Put it's him against different. me in a barbecue contest. Yeah. I'm finna smoke that ass for him. It's well, over. and that's the thing they don't people don't realize that. And I think uh, you know you even think about because uh, I watch, I'm a big foodie person, man. I love watching Food Network, and you look at the food competitions that are on Food Network. And then you compare them to what happens in the competition world. It's two different things, you know. Uh, people don't realize. People bash, you know, the competition world. Oh, that's not real barbecue and stuff like that. But it's like, oh, hold on a second. You don't really understand what goes into the competition barbecue, and you don't understand the purpose of like one bite for you know creating that that perfect bite, you know. And I didn't even realize it, right? It hasn't been until the last couple of years that I've kind of immersed myself into that, right? Because I'm, I'm a backyard guy. I'm not a competition guy, but 
you know, being able to see it firsthand, being able to taste it firsthand, you know, and see what everything goes into it, people just don't realize. And yeah, the the big people, the big chefs in the world, you know, that think they're this, they would be nothing in the barbecue competition world. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I can't. It comes to some stuff in the kitchen. I'm not. I'll tell you now, it ain't me. I, ain't same I here. I, I got ten thumbs. That's what I tell people. I'm not good at like plating or anything like that. You know. Uh, yeah, I'm not a plater to, either. Yeah, if you want me to bougie things up, uh, <laughs> you're looking at the wrong person too. It's just not gonna happen. You know, I'm gonna try to hit you with a bunch of good flavors and you know hope that wins you over. <laughs> So what's your number one go-to food that you want to cook the majority of the time? You know what's funny, and this is something me and you both have in common, is ribs. Uh, that That's just something, that was my go-to party uh, thing. You know, in the military, when people would come over to my house, you know, we'd do block parties and stuff like that. People would bring me ribs, you know. Uh, they'd bring me ribs the day before so I could sit there and experiment. And this is something I love doing to this day. People come over all the time, or if I have parties, local parties, people ask me, can you bring over ribs? Can you bring over ribs? You know, steak is another one, but ribs are definitely, you know, something I just enjoy. I enjoy ribs and I enjoy making ribs for people. And that's me. I enjoy making ribs, but I'm also a wings person. I love, I love me some ribs. wings too. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm both. I mean, yeah. I get it. Um, yeah. And, and I know this is crazy, but beef wise, I would rather have a burger than I had a steak. I, you know, I, I can't say that I love a good burger, but I think now that I've been on the West coast so much, I love tri tip so much. I, I've turned into a tri tip guy. I, I probably, if you ask me the three things I cook the most, it's going to be ribs, wings, and tri-tip. You know, that's kind of like my trinity. Is it very common to find tri-tip in the grocery store there a lot? Here, here it is. You know, I can go to Walmart right now if I wanted to, and there'll be a dozen tri-tip at Walmart, you know. So it's something, you know, obviously me growing up in North Carolina and Virginia and actually Mississippi, actually I lived in Mississippi when I was a kid, eight, nine, ten years old up in Pontotoc, Mississippi. But anyway, Not far from me. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Growing up in the in the South, you know, tri tip, I'd never heard of it. And matter of fact, when I went back home to North Carolina about a year ago, I actually found a local butcher that I could get tri tip so I could cook it, you know, for my family because they'd never had tri tip before. You know, they're like, We always see you cooking this tri tip. We gotta try it, you know. Of course my well, tri tip's gotta different. have some chimichurri on it. I'm a, I'm a chimichurri person too, with that I'm uh if I had to pick one big cut of beef, I'm more of a picanha person than I am. I, trust skin. me, you know, I, give me, give me a picanha. I mean, I would, I'd probably eat picanha more than I'd eat tri-tip, but I just can't get picanha on a regular. I have to go into Vegas, you know, yeah. get a butcher, you know, to get it. It's just not a cut of meat that I, I find regularly. Man, I know a guy that'll ship it direct to you there. Oh, I Kevin know, Green at the butcher shop will hook yeah, you up, man. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> He's uh that Australian picanha is um uh, it's really good. I really like it. Um I, I tell you I like Australian I mean, Wagyu probably better than any other Wagyu that's out there. Yeah, I have too. But you might be able to find some uh picanhas at your Costco. I know our Costco here. Every once in a while, every once in a while, we'll have them, but it's rare, to be honest. You know, we're, we're kind of lacking in Vegas. You go out to California, I get it. I, of course, I go to Texas, I get it. You know, but here, I pretty much have to go to like a, one of the specialty butchers in Vegas to get a picanha. Wow. And I'll so pay how for many? It too. <laughs> I bet. Uh, being in Vegas. Yeah, so yeah. how many, um, how many videos and stuff will you do this year? Total in total. Do you track that kind of stuff or just do, do you have I a probably motion? should? I, I probably should. Uh, I, I probably put out about five videos a, a, a week, you know, on oh average. Uh, 
you know, and it's a mixture, right? Some of it could be just like uh, an eight, 10 second clip, you know, just to, you know, try to get it to pop off or something like that. Some of it will be a cooking video. Another video will be more of an informational video, whether it be about one of my products or, you know, something I have going on or what have you. I don't do as much as I should be. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> well, I mean, we don't do that much. I'm going to be honest. I mean, we, we kind of take one or two a week and, and filter them down and bust them down into other clips and stuff. Right. Uh, it's just a lot to hold to to shoot videos every single day. Yeah, and, and that's where I get, you know, I can't. Like yesterday I did two videos in one day, right? You know, I try to do that when I can, you know, but sometimes it's hard with everything else going on, you know. I mean, this is this is my full time gig, you know, but at the same time frame, I also have to be the marketing manager, the warehouse manager, you know, the website guy, the the Amazon guy, everything else for now, you know, until I can yeah, get that's to a, a situation where I can hire a lot somebody. of responsibility. That's <clears throat> a lot of responsibilities for sure. That or either outsource. That's what I did at first. Yeah. You know. I, I had a, my fulfillment center was outsourced for a while. My problem was I couldn't find one that was local. And so I actually had one closer to you down in Louisiana, <clears throat> but just having my products in different places, you know, if I had it in a fulfillment center that was right down the road, it would be easier, you know, something I yeah. could run and go pick up products if I needed to. But, you know, having it, across the country just kind of made it difficult, you know, especially with me handling the the Amazon shipments, you know, out to Amazon and then the websites. And then if I need product on hand, you know, going to events and yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand that full system of every Avenue that stuff's got to go to, to make, make yeah. it work. It's definitely a lot that goes into it for sure. I definitely didn't realize it until I got into this mess. <laughs> Well, talking about adventures and travel and all that kind of stuff, where uh, where are you going? Where are you headed next? So, um, <clears throat> uh, the next big event, uh, I'm going out to Embers TV, uh, a launch party, which is going to be coming out soon. That's out in San Jose. Then I'm heading down to the Ace Hardware Show with Cosmos. So I'll be down there. I'll, I'll see you right there. across right across from you. Then we're going to head out uh, to the American Royal. I'll probably be with the Shed Barbecue team at the American Royal. You know, that's that's the upcoming stuff. Still, things are on the table. I think I'm going to try to go out to the Jack in some form or fashion, whether I'm helping somebody out or just going there as a spectator, you know, is my plans. We're going to spectate this year at the Jack and hang out and talk yeah. to people. And I might just have to around. do that. That way I can just roll around with you. <laughs> well, come on in. We make it work, man. Yeah. We'll make it work. But it, all that should be a good good time traveling. Have you ever been to the Jack before? No, I've never have been to the Jack. It's the one big event that I really haven't checked out. I've been wanting to do it, just kind of try to figure out, you know, you know what aspect or you know when I want to do it. I think I've always been busy. This is the first. You know, matter of fact, this is the first year I don't have a job, right? So I quit my job in last November to go full time with business. So in the past, I've job has kind of you know been the the hold up of doing yeah. it now that i'm full time with this i kind of make it as a mindset of every opportunity i can go out there to immerse myself you know in the industry and you know i gotta try to take advantage of it yeah and, that, and that's kind of the same way we are we want to see our friends though we don't you know coming from me i used to cook 35 events a year 30 to 35 right. and and it, it takes a toll on you after a while, but after, you know, we had another baby and all that kind of stuff. And so with business, the way it is, we've kind of scaled back, but now yeah. we're getting to where we can do a few things and that's kind of where I'm at. I don't want to go burn the road up again, but I want to go see everybody and talk to everybody. And so kind right. of the turn that our businesses took, I'm going to go just, just hang out with fans and see people and, and, and just be seen there and, um, and shake hands and kiss babies, that kind of thing. Right. But yeah. That's, uh, that's kind be, of what you got to do. <laughs> well, the Jack is just so cool. It never gets old going on a tour of the Jack distillery, uh, you know, in a sampling. And it's right. just so um, feeling you get 
when you're in the hollow there is nothing um it's kind of like that's what i heard it's a different feeling uh there and just going up on the square you know right from the distillery you're not supposed to be drinking and they tell you it's no right. open containers i mean you can drink but you got to have it in a cup right all that right you know, but it's really a dry town it's uh it's got some cool cool things you got to go get a barrel head and all that kind of stuff and your knickknacks right. actually jack down your shop and it's just a very cool event. The dinner on the hill, all that is very, very cool. Heck yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's definitely one of those, I've heard stories like what you talk about, and it just seems a little more, I don't know, kind of prestigious too. I mean, obviously the whole aspect, it's, it's a little more difficult to get into with the lottery set up and everything else. Yeah. Just, I think it's different to everybody. I think when you talk to they treat it differently well and that's even like the royal the royal is different for a lot of people that hadn't been compared oh, to yeah, like for sure. May and all that uh, the first year i went to the royal it was like 609 teams there it's crazy how many teams are out there well also you know you see in memphis you know how getting in the park and getting out of the park is and it's royal like you pull up to the gate you know where you're going yeah, yeah, I'm in such and such. Well, just stay straight till you see sign forward and hang a right. <laughs> right. Yeah, out. it ain't no. I it's mean, they don't care. Yeah, it's, it's definitely it's easier hard. to get in and out of there. You know, being in the middle of that racetrack there. You know, just yeah. a, a big, wide open area. You know. It's yes, cool definitely, uh, definitely a cool event. Uh, you know, and I've been asking people lately. I know you weren't a competitor at Memphis. So what are your thoughts on the Memphis and May deal after you've been there? Have you been there once or twice on the river? I've been there the three times, actually. I, I times. actually, yep, I've been there, you know, uh, to COVID, you know, the COVID one where we were actually in masks and everything, and they had people walking around, you know, trying to police that. Uh, yeah, I had a good I, time. I was there. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the next year when we went to uh, Tiger Stadium, out there and then then coming back to the river you kind of got a sense of when, when we came back to the river last year that obviously they were fighting for even to make it happen right uh there was a, a bunch of battling back between the memphis and may and then the town you know city of memphis <clears throat> you see you saw something going on and then then all the the different precautions that they were putting in you know uh, the money, because uh, I think they had y'all sign like some different insurance stuff that you, it was more or, or whatever. I, I'm not sure, but I knew there was something else in place. And then you get there and you see how the park, how it's con what they have fenced off, and of course the what everybody knows when it rains down there, it's going to get muddy no matter what you happen, right? And they had their own contractors helping people get in and out. You know, which they were really doing more of the damage than anybody, you know, out there. And then uh, I hear the reports, you know, coming in, you know, from you and others that actually, you know, had their own spot that, you know, the dollar amount, you know, it went from going from, you know, typically on average about $60,000 of damage to $1.4 million in damage. Uh, yeah. it, it don't add up. They know what they were doing. They planned this. And I feel like, unfortunately, we probably have been on the river for the last time uh, is, is what it feels like. I don't know what that looks like moving forward. I can understand as a competitor of wanting it to always be on the river. There's just something about it. But unfortunately, I don't think it's ever going to be on the river again. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I I hate that in one sense, um, but the other sense of me, you know, the the side that has to come back from the river and clean oh, yeah. all the mess up and all the mud yeah. and all the whatever yep. after cooking at Tiger Lane and all your stuff was still clean when you left Tiger Lane. For me, it's kind of of a toss up. I want to be on the river, but I'm not going to miss any mud from anywhere. No. And honestly, I think, you know, uh, whether we do it at Tiger Stadium or what, the Tiger Stadium, I think for a fan, I think it was easier for the people to come see Tiger Stadium, 
you know, that area, you know, it was hotter, you know, being on that asphalt and everything else. But that's going to change every year, right? One year it's going to be super hot, right? Uh, the next year it's going to rain like crazy. Unless you have you seen May anyway. We That's wore jeans saying, right? and, and jackets yeah. and hoodies before Memphis in yeah. May. So, so it's going to change, you know, no matter what. I think personally, you know, as far as getting in and out, like you talked about at Tiger Stadium, it was easy, you know. Uh, it's so much easier to manage our site. We didn't have to constantly clean up stuff like we would if we were on the river, you know, because we're dealing with mud or, or, or whatever, right? We weren't worried about that out there at Tiger Stadium. And I don't think if it would have, I mean, we had, we had that big storm, you know, uh, which it kind of worked out in a sense, right? There was a place for us to kind of shelter, so to speak, you know, even though it was fun having to head up to the stadium and, and shelter like that. But at least there was a plan in place for it. You know, whereas if we was on the river and a storm like that rolled, we'd be, you know, you know, fighting up the hill in mud, you know, trying to get out of there. Well, you know, they, um, they had that happen one time. They actually had to evacuate the park. I wasn't cooking it then. They had to move everybody over to like Monroe maybe. And it was a parking garage there. And oh, wow. it was one over from Bill street, Monroe or Madison. One of those, uh -huh. uh, yep. moves, uh going back North. And uh, everybody had to be in a parking garage because I know people that had meat stolen off of cookers near and all that. Oh, I can um, imagine. You know, you had to leave everything, abandon it, and and leave. Yeah. And uh, it, it was kind of a wild thing. And we seen um, – we've cooked here with tornadoes passing in the distance before and holding down tents with hail as big as golf balls at just local right. contests here. I mean, which is pretty yep. – stupid you know in the long term of things but back then we didn't have any sense i'm gonna be honest nowadays yeah, i wouldn't chance yeah. and i'd leave right but i guess that's you know what don't kill you makes you stronger right for sure all right mike tell everybody where they can find you at on social media and everything well, we're at at Blazing Star BBQ across all platforms of course my website is blazingstarbbq.com all right, guys, you heard it here from Mike. If y'all want to try some spicy rub, be sure to hit Mike up and give it a try. I can't wait to get some myself and give it a try on some ribs and wings. I'm going to put that old layer combo on there. Mike, oh, yes. awesome. I'll see you in a couple of weeks in Orlando, buddy. We'll catch a cold beer, all right? All right, brother. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate you for coming on and shooting the queue with me today, buddy. I'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Shooting the Queue podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media channels or through our website. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. Leave us a review if you enjoyed the show. Until next time, keep shooting the queue.